And then I did put up on the board here that, because we do have a winter storm warning, so if there is a snow day tomorrow, tomorrow I am going to do a video, all right, because I have to be done with this curriculum by May 9th, okay, so I just want to give you a heads up on uh, that, okay? All righty. So, I don't remember where we were at, so have we done this? and therefore can control gene expression uh, and so on. And so to understand this, first we have to understand kind of the structure of chromatin and, and so on. So, so the DNA wraps around these histone proteins. That's what we see here. And uh, each one of these little packages with the DNA wrapped around the histones um, is called a nucleosome. And so this is a, what it looks like in a real life picture of that. So a nucleosome is a piece of DNA round around, round around a protein core. And so that protein core is your histone protein. This histone DNA association remains intact throughout the whole cell cycle. So the DNA, as it goes through interphase, prophase, metaphase, and so on, um, stays bound around the histones. Um, the histones only temporarily separate or leave the DNA very briefly during DNA replication, which remember DNA replication is during what part of cell cycle? The S phase of interphase, right? S phase of interphase. So with very few exceptions, histones stay with the DNA during transcription and so it always kind of stays wrapped around these histone proteins, except very briefly during replication. So then the next level of DNA packing takes place between the histone tails of one nucleosome um, DNA that's wrapped around, all right, and the nucleosomes to the other side. So what happens is, you know, let me go back to this picture here. Oh, I thought I had a picture of the tails. I guess I don't. All right. Um, the, the histones interact with one another, and this causes the DNA, DNA to coil even tighter. And so we talk, I talked a little bit about this yesterday at the very beginning. So you get these loops, and then the loops loop on one another, and eventually it all coils together to eventually form your metaphase chromosome at the very end. Continue to coil and fold. Eventually, the DNA resembles that of the metaphase chromosome. <clears throat> and so, this, uh, when the DNA is tightly coiled around these histone proteins, the DNA is not readily available to do protein synthesis. So, and so we're going to talk a little bit about how we turn on genes. The first step of turning on a gene is making it so the DNA is available to do protein synthesis and not too tightly coiled. So before I go on though, I have a little uh, video I want to show you. And that, this, this one was a little animation, but I have a YouTube video because all my animations that go with this textbook don't work on this Google Chrome computer. So I have a in this animation, we'll see the remarkable way our DNA is tightly packed up so that six feet of this long molecule fits into the microscopic nucleus of every cell. The process starts when DNA is wrapped around special protein molecules called histones. The combined loop of DNA and protein is called a nucleosome. 
The nucleosomes are packaged into a thread known as chromatin. This fiber is then looped and further packaged using other proteins which are not shown here. The end result is that the DNA is tightly packed into the familiar structures we can see through a microscope, chromosomes. Chromosomes are not always present. They form around the time cells divide when the two copies of the cell's DNA need to be separated. At other times, as we can see now after the cell has divided, our DNA is less highly organized. It is still wrapped up around the histones, but not coiled in the chromosomes. Histone proteins. There are two different kinds of hetero, uh, uh, two different kinds of chromatin: heterochromatin and euchromatin. So during interphase, <coughs> some of the DNA remains condensed, as you would normally see it in metaphase. So these are some of the examples: the centrosomes, the telomeres, which remember are the ends, and some other regions of the chromosome. Which means that remember during interphase, after cell division, the DNA said becomes loosely packed again, and that's why we can't see it underneath the microscope. So what it's saying is most of the DNA is loosely packed, but there are certain sections that still stay tightly packed together. Those sections that stay tightly packed together are called heterochromatin. So this is called heterochromatin to distinguish it from euchromatin, which is the part that unravels. Euchromatin, which um, condenses and relaxes within the cell cycle. So it would condense starting in prophase and condense into a chromosome and relaxes after cell division. So most of the DNA is, is euchrom euchromatin, which then, like I said, unravels after um, uh, cell division. But we do have some called heterochromatin. Because heterochromatin is always tightly packed, it is rarely transcribed. That means, what does transcribed mean? Make an mRNA. So therefore, if it's rarely transcribed, then it rarely is used to make proteins, okay? So, and that's because it's so tightly packed, the DNA is all wound up around these histone proteins that the enzymes like RNA polymerase can't get to it to actually do protein synthesis. So it's why it's rarely transcribe. So most of our genes that we transcribe are part of euchromatin then. So let's look at the um, organization of chromatin. The structural organization of chromatin is important in helping regulate gene expression. Also the location of a gene's promoter relative to nucleosomes and the sites where DNA attaches to the chromosome scaffold or nuclear lamina that's the inside of the nucleus can also affect whether or not it's transcribed or not. So so the organization of chromatin and where the gene is at on the DNA can help determine whether or not it's going to be transcribed. So research indicates that chemical modification to the histones and DNA of chromatin influence both the chromatin structure and therefore gene expression. So that's what we're going to look at next is, is chemical modification. Um, we can modify the proteins in the DNA and therefore that can be helpful in turning on or off certain genes. So, <coughs> so let's look at, so all organisms like our cells must regulate which genes are expressed at any given time. So some genes are turned on, some genes are turned off, um, and sometimes we can turn on and off genes in a particular cell or sometimes between two different types of cells, um, certain genes are turned on and, cer and, and certain genes are always turned off um, in particular types of cells. So a uh, multicellular organism like our cells, the cells undergo what we call cell differentiation, which means that the cell becoming specialized to do a particular function in our body. 
Uh, and so this usually happens early on in development, which we'll look at after, after we go through this. Um, we'll look at development a little bit and to look at um, how these cells become specialized. So our different types of cells, like the cell in your eye versus the cell on your stomach versus the cell on your skin, um, and so on. All of them have, remember, the same chromosomes, the same DNA, but what makes them different is the genes that are expressed, what genes are turned on, and therefore what proteins are made in different cells. This is called differential gene expression. So differences between cell types result from differential gene expression, by definition the expression of different genes by cells with the same genome. So we're gonna look at, in us, how is a cell, we'll look at specifically a liver cell and a cell from your eye, the lens of your eye, and why liver cells make certain proteins and um, lens cells make certain proteins, but they're different proteins, but they have the same genome. Um, each type of differentiated cell um, has a unique subset, subset of genes that are expressed, meaning that all cells have the same genes, but only certain ones are actually turned on and are expressed to make proteins. That's what express means, is the ability to make proteins. So when we look at gene expression and making a protein, to give you a particular trait, there are different stages that can be regulated in eukaryotic cells. For, so for eukaryotic cells, it's a little bit more in depth than in prokaryotic cells. So if we look at this particular picture, this is, most of this is a review from chapter 17, this picture. This is protein synthesis. So what we have here, this big yellow thing is your cell. Then you have your nucleus, and it's labeled nucleus. You have your chromatin, um, so it's the DNA wrapped around the, the histone proteins. So if we look here, the first step in gene expression is the gene being able to be transcribed. So is the gene available for transcription? So we're gonna talk a minute, in a minute about that. That's where we're gonna start. We're gonna kind of move our way down through here. Because basically at each step, there's different parts of regulating um, uh, the protein. So is it available? So remember I said that sometimes when the DNA is wrapped around the proteins and it's tightly packed together, the, the enzymes don't have access to the DNA, and so therefore it can't be expressed. And so therefore, do, do, is the, the gene have availability or access that RNA polymerase can bind and make the mRNA in the first place? So that's the first thing. Then we can regulate transcription and how transcription occurs. Transcription is making your mRNA. Remember for eukaryotic cells, we make an mRNA with both introns and exons, and so we have this, um, uh, RNA processing is the next step where we cut out the introns and add the cap and the tail. The mRNA then gets, it says here, transported to the cytoplasm. Specifically, where is it going to go in the cytoplasm? The ribosome, right? And it goes to the ribosome where translation occurs, which it's read, remember, in groups of three, which stands for each amino acid, so you build the polypeptide. But even after the polypeptide is built, you might not have a finished protein, so we might have to chemically modify it and so on. And so then the protein will fold on itself and eventually you get it in the right shape. So you have your active protein, let's say this is an enzyme here, so it has a specific shape to catalyze a particular reaction. And then these proteins that are made necessarily don't stay in your cells forever. So that's what this last part is, is sometimes then we can allow this protein to be active and therefore certain chemical reactions to happen in the cell for a while. And then you can degrade the protein and break it down back into the amino acids. And therefore it would stop the reaction. So, so this is kind of the process here up to your protein synthesis. I want to spend a minute here and talk about this little side arrow off of here. Your mRNA, when it's made, can goes to the ribosome and, and goes through this process here of translation and so on, but the mRNA doesn't stay in the cell forever. And so this little arrow to the right is the breaking down of the mRNA. So there are enzymes that will break the mRNA down and therefore then it would, your, your cell would stop making the protein. If you never broke down the mRNA, then you'd have mRNA in your cells from your, when you were a baby and therefore you wouldn't be able to really control what's going on in your cells because you'd have every mRNA that you've ever made and therefore made any protein that you've ever made in your life and therefore um, you wouldn't have any control over that. So we, we degrade the mRNA. In eukaryotic cells, the mRNA, depending on the cells, can stay in there for a few hours. 
to a couple weeks, all right? So it just depends. And um, when you degrade it, what that means is then um, you're gonna stop making the protein, which means then um, whatever this protein's job was in the cell is not gonna happen. And so therefore you've turned off whatever um, that, that protein was controlling. To turn it on again, you have to remake the mRNA and make the protein again. So it allows us to kind of control what kinds of things are going on in the cell. So we're gonna start at the top here. So this is where we're start, starting right here at the very beginning of the control where the genes are available for transcription. So genes with highly packed heterochromatin are usually not expressed. So we just talked about that. They're too highly packed, the DNA is not exposed. <clears throat> Chemical modifications to histones in DNA of chromatin influence both the chromatin structure and gene expression. So we're gonna look at what chemical modifications can happen to histones and which ones can happen to DNA that influence the structure. So the first one is histone modifications. In histone acetylation, acetyl groups are attached to positively charged lysines. In the histone tails, lysines are amino acids. That is, uh, one of the 20 types of amino acids. So we attach the, or the cell attaches these acetyl groups. And what they found is that this process seems to loosen the chromatin structure and promotes the, the start or initiation of transcription. So here we have this picture here. And my, yours is labeled, mine is not here. But what um, what it does here is it takes this, this box here. So you're looking at just part of this. So this, these three here, or these four, or these four here. All right, so that's what you're looking at. So here's the DNA wrapped around the histone protein. So in blue, I think it's labeled on yours that it's DNA. And these little, these guys here are these are your histone proteins. And I think the little, the tails are labeled on your diagram. So those are your histone tails. They're chains of amino acids that are kind of hanging off of those proteins here with the DNA wrapped around it. This whole thing together, do you guys remember what it's called when the DNA is wrapped around the histone proteins? Nucleosome. So the whole, this whole thing is a nucleosome. So, so here, so, so you have this uh, bunch of nucleosomes that make up your chromatin. So here's your chromatin. Um, <coughs> and so you can see that the, the nucleosomes are all kind of bunched together here. And so what uh, acetylation does is add acetyl groups to the histone tails here. So if we look from here to here, we can obviously see that the nucleosomes have kind of unraveled from one another, exposing the DNA in there. And this is to do with the addition of acetyl groups. In this picture here, what are the acetyl groups? What do you think? What would I label as the acetyl groups, do you think? So from here to here. So your picture says unacetylated histones and acetylated. So they've been added, that means they've added acetyl groups. So in this picture here, this has acetyl groups, this doesn't. So what do you think it is in my picture? The little green dots, all right? So the little green dots here, I'm putting green here, all of these are acetyl groups that were added to the histone tail. So these guys here, so here, notice that there's no dots, so there's no acetyl groups here added to this. So what did the acetyl groups do? The addition of the acetyl groups triggered the loosening up of the chromatin and exposing the DNA. So why is the DNA being exposed important? because 
here, part of the DNA, this part of the DNA is still wound around, but this part is exposed. This part is wound around and this part is exposed. So let's say you have a gene from right here to right here. This gene now, enzymes like RNA polymerase have access to that gene. So that gene can now be trans, um, uh, transcribed and translated. So you can make an mRNA molecule from it, which then you can make a protein because it's exposed. And the only reason why it's exposed is because of the addition of the acetyl groups. So over here, that gene is in the DNA and is buried in the mix of all these nucleosomes all tightly packed together. So it exposes this. Um, and so it exposes the DNA and, and translation can happen. So that's the first thing, is that when we looked at that overview picture, it said the gene has to be available for transcription. This is what we're talking about. It has to be open and um, available to get at, to tra transcribe. And that is, <laughs> that is done by a, the addition of acetyl groups. On the flip side, we move on, we can, there's something called DNA methylation. In DNA methylation, the addition of methyl groups to certain bases in the DNA is associated with reduced transcription in some species. <coughs> so this one, methyl groups are added to DNA. Remember, acetyl groups were added to the histone tails. Methyl groups are added to DNA, and it reduces transcription. And so uh, the acetyl groups enhanced transcription or allowed transcription to happen. This is just the opposite. So in some species, DNA methylation causes long-term inactivation of genes and cellular differentiation when they become specialized. So remember, <clears throat> same genes and uh, you have the same genes in different tissues. Um, but what happens is that when we look at these genes in different tissues, we find that the genes are usually more heavily methylated in cells in which they're not expressed. So what does that mean? Um, you have cell A and cell B. Cell A makes a protein, cell B doesn't. But they both have genes to make the protein, but only one cell is making it and this one's not. So in studying the one that doesn't make it, um, studying that gene, they found that the gene has lots of methyl groups on it. So therefore, that correlation between turning that gene off in this cell, so it doesn't work in this cell by adding the methyl groups, and you didn't add the methyl groups here. And so relating this, uh, adding methyl groups to turn off genes, um, relating this to genetics and genomic imprinting methylation turns off either the maternal or paternal alleles of certain genes at the start of development. So remember when we talked about how um, that certain genetic disorders, um, if you're big R, little r, that you silence one of your genes, um, either from mom or dad. So in this case here, let's say the person is big R, little r, and let's say they got the big R from mom and the little r from dad. Um, let's say that in this particular disorder that the, uh, or for this particular gene that uh, mom's becomes methylated. So if mom's gene becomes methylated and you add methyl groups to it, you silence that gene, you turn that gene off. And so even though you have a big R on that chromosome, you don't show a big R, and so this person would actually have a little R, which might be a mutated form of the gene, and these guys, this person would have the disorder, even though their genotype is big R, little R. Now, another kid in the same family might inherit the little R from mom and the big R from dad. So, genetically, they're the same. They have a normal gene and a recessive gene, but if the for this um, gene, if mom's is always methylated, mom's is turned off, then in this particular case, they do not have the disorder. And so because dad's is left to work, and so only one works, and so that's how that works. And so, so in this case here, you can have two people with the same genotype actually the same DNA, all right, big R, normal DNA, little R, mutated DNA, but have different phenotypes as a result of that. And so this has nothing to do with the, whether or not they have this disorder, has nothing to do with the order of the bases of the DNA. Um, it has to do with what's methylated. This is called epigenetic 
inheritance. Although the chromatin modifications just discussed that we just discussed do not alter the DNA sequence, so the DNA sequence is the same, they may be passed to future generation of cells. And these inheritance of traits transmitted by these mechanisms that don't directly involve the nucleotide sequence of your DNA, so it's not the order of the bases, it's which one has been methylated, is called epigenetic inheritance. So you can pass that on to your kids. All right, so that's pre-transcription. So then methylating makes transcription not be able to happen, and adding acetyl groups makes it be able to happen. So let's say then that transcription is going to occur. How do we regulate transcription? This is the most important, um, this is the main way that we regulate um, gene expression is through transcription. Chromatin modifying enzymes provide initial control of gene expression by making a region of DNA either more or less able to bind to the transcription machinery. All right, let's talk about that here. So you have a DNA molecule. What's, what in the world is the transcription machinery? Here's your gene to be transcribed. What needs to happen? What do we, what do we know about what needs to happen for transcription to occur? Yeah. RNA polymerase needs to bind. So RNA polymerase is gonna be used to make the mRNA. How does RNA polymerase know where to bind. That's right. So here we have the promoter region. Part of that promoter region, we remember the TATA box. The TATA box uh, and then transcription factors bind. And that's how RNA polymerase knows where to bind and RNA. And remember then it can go and transcribe the, the, the gene. So that's what we know about transcription. So this is the transcription machinery that we're talking about. What we're gonna learn is that, so, so this is how it happens, but this doesn't show how we control it. So how is it, we're gonna learn, how is it that we can make this gene in one type of our cell be turned on, and therefore um, uh, this can happen. And in the same DNA in another cell, it doesn't. And so I'm gonna um, add a little bit um, uh, to this, and kind of another layer to this. All right, so let's look at organization of a typical eukaryotic gene. Associated with most eukaryotic genes are what we call control elements. This is new. Segments of non-coding DNA that help regulate transcription by binding certain proteins. Non-coding DNA. What does that mean? An intron. So what was it not coding for? Proteins, right? So non-coding DNA doesn't code for a protein, so introns would be an example of that. Um, uh, Alpha air doesn't code for a protein. But it doesn't have to be an intron. I don't want you to think that it has to be an intron. We have lots of non-coding DNA. We talked about that before where you have some genes do code for DNA, meaning that they, that they make an mRNA, which make, or sorry, code for protein, to make a protein. That's a coding gene here. Um, but some segments of the DNA make RNA, which are used to make ribosomes, and therefore never make a protein from it. That would be a non-coding gene. Um, you have another gene that makes the tRNA, which goes and picks up the amino acids that are used to build the protein and so on. So there's lots of non-coding DNA. Um, so these control elements, this new part, and the proteins they bind are critical the precise regulation of gene expression in different cell types. So, in the addition here of this. So let's look at this picture here. 
So yours is labeled. And, um, so let's look in here. Here's your gene. So we have axons and introns making up your gene. So there's your gene. Here's your promoter region. And so from here, so the promoter region can have the tata box, right? And so there's your promoter region in your gene. So this is like what I was just talking about here. So we've talked about transcription factors, RNA polymerase can then make your mRNA. So this is transcription here. So this is your primary transcript or sometimes called your pre-mRNA because it's not your final mRNA because it still has introns, right? So it still has the introns, so we made the mRNA. Then this would be RNA processing where you're showing you're cutting out the introns. These are the introns here. And adding your cap and your tail there, and so that's your RNA processing. So this part is the, this, the old part. So what we're adding this layer here is that upstream from the promoter region, so here's your promoter region, you have these areas that in my picture are in yellow. They are called control elements. And so <clears throat> notice here, that uh, it says on yours that this is, prox this is proximal control elements. That means it's in close proximity, it's close to the gene, so here's the gene. Whereas here, these little lines here represent that there's lots of DNA between this segment and this segment. So way upstream here, you have these control elements. And so these three that are far away collectively are called an enhancer. And so yours is labeled that, but I'm gonna put here that in this particular case, you have three control elements, making up that one enhancer. Now, what, what are these control elements? These control elements <coughs> bind certain proteins. So proteins bind to this. What are the proteins? Um, the proteins could be activators, Activators, what do you think it's activating if they bind to those? What are we trying to get to happen here? Transcription, right? So it's going to activate and turn the ice genes on so that you can actually do this process of transcription and so on. So that's your activators or sometimes the repressors can bind to there. Repressors aren't going to activate these genes, they're going to repress them or make them so that you can't do transcription. So that part is new. Um, and this is the part that is, um, is important in turning um, genes on in specific cells and off in other cells. So imagine this. Um, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example a little bit here. So, so that's, what, uh, that's kind of the general overview. So this part is new. So we're going to take a look at specific activators here and give an example here. So the roles of transcription factors. This little part is a review. To initiate or start transcription, eukaryotic RNA polymerase requires the assistance of proteins called transcription factors. So we know that RNA polymerase can't bind and start transcription without transcription factors. General transcription factors are essential for the transcription of all protein coding genes. So all protein coding genes, so these are general transcription factors, which means that these transcription factors are found in all types of cells. So you might have to say these transcription factors in the cells of your eyeball, in the cells of your pancreas, um, and so on. So, so those are general transcription factors. We're going to see that in just a minute that there are also specific ones. General transcription factors bind to specific DNA sequences or other regulatory proteins. Specific DNA sequence, example, TataBox. So this is the transcription factors binding to the TataBox. So that's that we know. But in us, in eukaryotic cells, high levels of transcription of particular genes depend on these control elements interacting with specific transcription factors. So these guys right here, what we talked about before with these transcription factors, these are very general transcription factors in other cells. Um, when we look at the control elements that we just looked at, 
when we look at the control elements, the, um, there are specific molecules that bind to these guys, and these are specific transcription factors. So I'll show you a picture of that in just a second here. So as we just looked at the picture, the, proximate, the proximal control elements are the elements that are in close to the promoter, so they're in close proximity to the promoter, whereas distal control elements were far away, which remember are groups of which are called enhancers, can be far away from the gene. And some transcription factors are activators. An activator is a protein that binds to an enhancer and stimulates the transcription of a gene. So in that last picture, you saw that. So I'm looking at this picture. Did I go too fast? No, I'll go back. And remember, these are your three, this is your enhancer, your three control elements where um, your activator can bind to. And so you can see here that there are three in this example. It doesn't always have to be three. They're just showing you three control elements here. In this example, there are each, the, uh, since the control elements, the colors are important here. These three control elements means that they're the same control elements, which means the same type of activator binds to each one of them. So therefore the shape, notice that all three of these, the shape and the color are the same. So they bind to it. Over here, this is your gene, right? Because this, this is your DNA. And then here's your tata, here says the tata box and this whole thing is your promoter. All right, so, that, so this is the distal control elements far away from that. So notice here, once these activators, all three activators bind, what that triggers to happen from here to here is a couple of things. Um, the bending of the DNA. So we have the, the, notice here that the enhancer region, the way it bends, and this is why this needs to be so far away. This is why it's distal. It's supposed to be so far away so that when the DNA bends, the um, enhancer region is kind of right almost on top of the promoter region here. And so if you bend here, we have a bending protein, yours is already labeled here, that stabilizes that bend. And in comes, you have your little molecules, these are your different transcription factors. So notice that these are general transcription factors, these are found in all types of cells. And so what happens is, is that as we've learned before, is the transcription factors bind to the Tata box so that's what we're going to see here. It binds, this right here is the Tata box, right here. So your transcription factors are binding there, but now we add another layer into this. What else does the transcription factors bind to? The enhancer region, the activators and the enhancer. So therefore, the transcription factors bind to both the enhancer region and the Tata box. And that right there is when what what triggers RNA polymerase now to combine to the promoter region and start transcription. So this arrow here is, means that it's gonna transcribe the DNA. And so what happens is, to, in order to transcribe the DNA, you have to have the RNA polymerase bind. RNA polymerase doesn't bind unless you have your transcription factors. The transcription factors have to bind to the Tata box and these activators, which means that the activators have to be bent over here, um, which doesn't happen unless you have the activators present in the cell in the first place. Um, and so, so this part right here, this bending and these control elements and the enhancer is the new part um, in, in this. Now, how does this relate? Remember the whole purpose of this? is to talk about how we turn genes on and off. So in this case here, what did we just do? Did we turn this gene on or off? On, right? We just made this on because now RNA polymerase is gonna make an mRNA and um, then we can make a protein. So we've turned this gene on. So how can this gene be turned on in one cell and off and not to be turned on in another cell? And it all has to do with this new part here, this enhancer region and these activators. So for instance, if this was a picture of a cell, if this would happen to a cell, 
where it didn't have these activators. So let's say the cell didn't have the activators. Could this gene be turned on? No. All right, and so therefore, certain cells in your body have certain activators and other cells don't have the same activators. And so depending upon what combination of activators you have depends upon what genes can be turned on in the cell. And so I'll go through an example in just a second here. So this particular example is with an activator. We said also that these could be activators or what? Repressors, right? So let's look at this a little bit here. So some transcription factors can function as repressors. So the example I did was with activators, but they can also repress and therefore stop a repressor. If it gets there and binds to the control element, then an activator can't bind there um, and therefore won't express the gene. And so activators and repressors kind of can work together in turning on and off certain genes. And they can also act indirectly by influencing the chromosome structure by changing the structure slightly to make transcription um, uh, happen or not. So activators change the chromosome, the chromatin structure by, going back to this picture, Activators change the chromatin structure by actually causing the bend and allowing that to happen. And so if that structure doesn't happen, that bend does not happen, then um, this gene would stay off. So therefore, this gene could stay off by a couple reasons. Not having the right activators or by having a repressor that binds to there and blocks the activators. If you have a repressor that gets there first, then the activators can't bind. All right, so therefore we can control them. So let's look at a particular example. So a particular combination of control elements can activate transcription only when the appropriate activator proteins are present. That's what I just said. You have to have the right activators. Oops, I'm crazy here. Okay, so let's look at this example here. So here you have the nucleus of two different types of cells in our body. So yours is labeled liver and the lens cell. The lens is in your up, okay? And so <coughs> now we have two different genes. You have the albumin gene, so this is the albumin gene. Albumin, this is a gene that codes for the protein called albumin. This is the protein in your blood. So blood. And then we have the crystalline gene. This codes for making the protein called crystalline. This is the protein in your lens. Of your eye. So let's look at the structure of the gene. You have the promoter region. So this, this is your promoter region. This is the gene. This is your promoter region. This is the gene. And these guys right here are what? These are your enhancers. Okay, so in your liver and your lens, you have both of these genes. So in our eyes, we have the gene to make albumin, we have the gene to make crystalline. In our liver cells, we have the gene to make albumin, the gene to make crystalline. So if you look here, all right, albumin, the albumin gene in the liver cell is expressed. So we see this bending and RNA polymerase combined and it's gonna make the mRNA and make the albumin protein. So we say that this gene is expressed and the crystalline gene is not. In the lens, in our eyes, the crystalline gene is expressed and we get the crystalline protein to make our lens of our eye. But the albumin gene is not. So we don't, get, we don't make blood proteins in our eyes, in the lens of our eyes. But yet we have the genes for that. So my question to you is, looking at the picture, let's just focus on the albumin gene. Why is the albumin gene expressed in the liver and not in the lens cell? So may I have you talk to the person next to you and come up with an answer uh, explaining why the albumin gene is expressed in the liver and not the lens. Maybe may helpful to look, I don't know, if it's, yeah, you can tell on yours. I wasn't sure about the shape. 
The only difference that you see is what we said. Well, yeah. Good. When the <laughs> okay, so the so he's saying that if the activator is a different shape, it doesn't bind to the enhancers. Yeah. Okay. All right, yep, all right, so it has to do with the shape of the activator and the type of activators. So if you look at between the liver and the lens cell, do they have the same types of activators? Absolutely not, and how we tell that is by the shape, all right? And so, and then also, if you look, the albumin has certain um, control elements that make up their enhancer. And so their enhancer region is three, this yellow one, binds to a general transcri transcription factor, but the, green, uh, the gray and the um, red here have specific transcription factors that have to have specific shapes to be able to bind to it. And so the liver cell happens to have both of those transcription factors or both of those um, specific activators that bind. And so therefore, since it has all that's needed to bind, then it causes the bending and the transcription general transcription factors bind and therefore RNA polymerase knows where to bind and you get albumin made. Whereas in the lens cell, notice here, the albumin gene still has the same three control elements and it even has one of the activators. It has the gray activator, but it's missing that red activator. So really it's the combination of activators. So an enhancer region, you need multiple control elements as the key is that do the cell have all of those those activators. Even if they only have some, it doesn't trigger the um, protein to be made. So looking at and relating that to the crystalline gene is the same thing. Notice that the crystalline gene, it's a different gene, so therefore has a different combination of control elements to, um, to control it. And so here they have the orange, the gray, and the pink here. In this case, if we look at where it's turned on, each one of these needs a specific activator um, of a specific shape. The lens cell happens to have all three of them as the pink one with the shape that goes within the gray and the orange versus the liver cell. Notice that there was one in common between the albumin and the crystal and the gray one. It's just the different combinations here of the other control elements. So the gray binds to this, but because the liver cell is lacking the orange and the pink one, the, the crystalline gene is not turned on in the liver cell um, and therefore is in the um, lens cell. And so therefore, um, this is how these control elements and the activators can turn on genes in certain cells and off genes, can, uh, turn, or uh, keep the genes off in other cells. And that's why we don't make blood protein in our lens of our eye, okay? All right. <coughs> We're gonna write this because this goes with that picture. Don't go away yet. The combination of transcription factors binding to the regulatory regions at any one time determines how much, if any, of the gene um, product will be produced. All right, and this is what we'll say. Okay, so um, so if we do have a soda tomorrow. 
<laughs> what? Oh, we do. Yeah. So what is it?